Father Tracy Carcel, you are a father. Would you lead us in the pledge of faith? <laughs> My name is Bob Morris, 6020 East, Seattle, on South, member of the Water Advisory Committee, speaking tonight only for myself. The town has a marvelous opportunity to immediately cut into the wastewater treatment plant operating losses by successfully negotiating a processing deal with Liberty Utilities. It is a one-time opportunity with a time fuse. The plant is only operating at one-third of capacity. That is capacity the town is paying for every day and is being wasted while it's idle. The town can either make a deal, bring in millions of dollars, or make nothing on that capacity. The capacity is depreciating away unused. The waste is from the carefree treatment plant that's being shut down. It will go either to Scottsdale, who is currently handling 80% of the carefree waste, or it'll go to us. I highly recommend that it be carefree. We can even we even have a negotiating advantage, which any negotiator loves, because we know or can know if we look to find out what Scottsdale is paying, because they're paying for it now. Liberty will pay us upfront capacity charge measured in millions of dollars, fees to cover all the expenses, and we get to keep the water to use for golf courses. It can be a win, win, win situation. The water stays in this part of this town instead of being shipped south. I urge the town to not lose that opportunity and to negotiate the best deal possible. After attending the initial meeting, the Water Advisory Committee has seen no further information, offers or counteroffers. I sincerely hope the town does not miss this opportunity, which will soon disappear to Scottsdale's benefit if we do not aggressively pursue it. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Allen. Bill Allen, 38914 North 73rd Street, Cave Creek. It's not the Water Advisors Committee members' uh, intent at this particular point in time to dominate the cause of the public, but I do have something that I think I need to say. I'd like to thank the Sonora News for bringing one facet of the Water Advisory Committee Desert Gold Initiative to the attention of the general public. That particular issue is that deals with specifically Rancho Mignon. It's a shame that the entire initiative was not reported as in the paper, in the paper as it was, it has the potential for eliminating reported uh, 1.2 million dollars annually that must be taken from the general fund to support to support the uh, the town's enterprise fund not only would the water advisory committee proposals have eliminated uh, this large transfer from occurring in the future a proposed transfer of a portion of the liberty water utility system that much needed initial funding to upgrade the water system here in town, also providing an increased annual revenue stream and a more effective utilization of the town's wastewater treatment plant. Instead, the Sonora News decided to publish an inappropriate synopsis uh, of the Water Advisory Committee's committee meeting, Committee's meeting 
when Bob Morris detailed the points of the Rancho Mignana Town Creek contract that most of you sitting on the council at this particular point in time actually approved. The item was, was a request to and was agendized, although I was definitely could have made a more appropriate uh, definition of what the topic was going to be. I listed it as a subcommittee report, and uh, it was a subcommittee report, and it was reported in the agenda and also at the meeting. It just so happened that the, the committee had requested that Bob Morris make that presentation at the previous meeting that was held. Are there any questions? I would be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. I have that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lavon Lindahl. I live at 6701 East Tanya Road in Cave Creek. Honorable Town Council members, in the folder just presented to you by uh, the Desert Awareness Committee, many of whom are here tonight, I think they're standing, Councilwoman Clancy especially will note from her association with the area schools that there is mention of Desert Awareness Committee's Desert Reach program for fourth graders. Desert Reach has received some good news. An $8,600 grant from the APS Foundation will enable fourth graders to visit the Town of Cape Creek's Desert Awareness Park for a desert field experience. Yes, they will visit Cape Creek's own public park over by Vermeer's Road, where you or you and your horse can take a little walk on its signed nature trails. You will notice that the trails connect with other local trails. This park belongs to you, to all of us. It is used regularly by both tourists and local folks, including professional organizations giving classes. April 30th is the date the park will host the Desert Reach fourth graders for a powerful chapter in their growing awareness of the Sonoran Desert's plant and animal life and appreciation for where we live. Did you know that the Cave Creek Desert Awareness Park won the 1996 Governor's Award for the best beautification and forestry program. When the town accepted 26 acres of land from Gateway Development, this open space became an award-winning park because Desert Awareness Committee members volunteered designing and marking trails and helping organize the entire communities coming together to build an amphitheater, picnic and restroom areas, and a playground. Financing came from Arizona State Parks Heritage Fund, the town of Cave Creek, Foothills Community Foundation and over 60 others. This sweet little park with its natural shelter, pond, and wildlife represents a lot of labor and monetary investment by our community and requires only a little maintenance by the town. We now detect the park is in danger of losing town funding. What an insult to the local community's past and ongoing efforts to create and enhance the park if the town neglects this valuable resource. The Desert Awareness Park needs, before the April visit by the fourth graders, a few posts to anchor three additional shade sails to provide sun protection during talks in the amphitheater. Cost of post and sails, only about $400. Replacement of worn out picnic grammatis shade sails is also needed because of this year researching. Labor for installation is mostly provided by volunteers who also do most ongoing care. Why isn't there anything left in the budget for these few items, some of which we've been suggesting for be replaced for years? Now they've become torn and bedraggled. As a liaison, give us a contact on the town council who listens to what we are saying. We are not asking for redesign of the wash or reclamation of ground lost during floods, just replacement of things aged and worn by the time. We want your commitment to the park and to meet with you tomorrow. <laughs> by the way, don't buy into the argument by some that the park should compete with the rodeo grounds for funds. Comparing two such completely different et uh, entities is not a rational stance. And speaking of commitment, the same Girl Scout troop that has already done outstanding <coughs> volunteer work at the park will be back on April 12th to paint and spruce up the park's playground equipment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the president of the Cape Creek Gift Days Rodeo and the Cape Creek Pro Rodeo Association. I was asked here tonight to give a rodeo recap, which we do on an annual basis. However, we're not even close to being ready for that. We're still cleaning up out there. I took close to 250 pounds um, to the Foothills Food Bank today of leftover soda, juices, product from the, the cantina. And uh, only, only Pam was there to help me unload. So we're still pretty busy. We'll be back in May in full force to tell you how successful Fiesta Days was. But a couple of quick thoughts I wanted to share with you. Um, changing the parade and the kickoff weekend from rodeo weekend was, as we predicted, a very good idea. It um, helped with safety, it helped with traffic, it helped with congestion, and it certainly kept um, a fun a fun event with bike week and a fun event with the parade separate, which we need to do for our own safety reasons. We have a lot of novice riders in a parade and we have to keep their safety in mind. So it was a huge success. We've talked to the majority of merchants in town. They love the format. They love having a kickoff celebration in town. Buffalo Chip hosted the mutton busting. It was fantastic there. They want to keep doing that. And our kickoff dance was that Saturday night, the weekend before rodeo. It helped all of us with this event and helped us get some rest. Rodeo weekend was a tremendous success. We had sellout crowds. We moved more seats. I know um, that sounds like a broken record, but we sold out the section we rented, which expanded section five by three times, 664 seats sold out. We could have sold standing room only if we could reconfigure it. We had a lot of planning to do. We'd like to thank the town. We'd like to thank Marshall Stein and his crew for all the help with their safety and traffic controls. The town crew that helped us out at the grounds. Everything's fantastic. We've got a lot of growing to do and a lot of work together. But Fiesta Day at the 38th annual was a tremendous success. And I'll have a full report coming in May. Thank you. about my frustrations for the community um, via regarding the Surrey Hill Trail that was recently by the fifth list is plowed back to natural vegetated state. So there is no actual map you can get here at the town. The Marshall and I have kind of come together to see if we can create some kind of trail network map for the city's usage and handing that out to the public. But before that happens, people come to the flat tire bike shop and they ask me a lot of trail questions. And there is no, I don't know, there's no there's no news about what's going on. Now I've heard that maybe they illegally without permits plowed all that stuff back to natural state, even though they own the property, they may not have applied for the permits. So apparently, I don't know what's going on. The public doesn't know what's going on. I just want to just voice my frustration regarding the easement. I know that the town is working on it, but I just want to say, just because two months ago we struck this on the, the, the you know, the rug, uh, I was called a bad apple by a former town council person who's here. This is a personal thing for me, and I think that you really do need to figure out the access. We unanimously voted up here to say that the Canyon Ridge Estates could not change the hours of operation and handgun carrying and all that wonderful smoking idea on the trail. So we do stand behind the trail usage. I know that Cape Creek identifies very hardcore with trail usage and Surrey Hill, it needs to be connected to the Desert Foothills Land Trust land, and that's about it. And then also regarding that Desert Awareness Gateway Park, the pond, if you're going to fix that thing, just like I knew if my mother in law is going to come visit, I would clean up the house a little bit. If you're going to have a whole bunch of people come, you probably want to take care of that pond as well. And whatever Joe Dana wants, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Town manager for Joe, and he give an update uh, the next council meeting. Sure. We're not we're not in charge right now. Unless you want to start. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak? I call the public is still open. 
council will, will proceed. Uh, town manager or anything? Not the <coughs> we'll move on to the consent. There are uh, six items on the consent. Uh, motion to approve council. Second. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I have to accuse myself of being wrong. Some of these uh, meetings, I wasn't there. I Um, well, if you're, there's a difference between the who's being that and Well, I know, but on some of them, I can say yes to some, and I can say no to some. I don't want to make it difficult, but since I was not, um, the special minutes to a meeting on the 16th or on the 2nd. Well, there's two percent there. Uh, are there recusal work for you? Yes, that's kind of pretty good. Uh, Carrie, that the record reflects that council will only. Cassie, mm -hmm. recruit yourself on noting on the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. On to the general agenda items. Report by the town marshal, item Stein, and council discussion. And uh, on traffic and related issues during the yesterday's event, bike week event, and other special events during the year involving uh, road closure. This is a report only. Council will take no action. Marshall. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, Reverend Spike Week, Spike Week began on 21 March, which was Saturday, same day we had the Fiesta Day parades. Um, Town of Cape Creek closed the roads from approximately 5 in the morning uh, until about 11.30 in the afternoon for the Fiesta Day parade. Upon completion of the Fiesta Day parade, which by the way was a lovely parade if you didn't get a chance to go, uh, very well attended. Uh, no major mishaps, we had one uh, one horse drawn carriage accident, which is kind of a first in my 13 years, but uh, minor injuries and uh, didn't really cause any further traffic delays, thank God. The parade was very nice. Um, upon termination of the parade, which I said was approximately 12 o'clock, the right way was turned over for the bike week festivities taking place uh, throughout town. Um, the town issued a permit which allowed seven days of roadway uh, restrictions. Again, beginning on 21 March, which was Saturday, ending on 29 March, which was Sunday. Um, peak days for the event were Saturdays and Sundays. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we had um, very light traffic considerably. Uh, throughout the event, the right lane of traffic was restricted in each direction. One light, right lane was restricted from approximately Dairy Queen, um, east up until uh, just past Harold's. Then one lane of traffic was restricted uh, beginning at Galloway Drive in the westbound direction and terminating at approximately Dairy Queen as well. Um, those lanes of traffic were utilized for uh, motorcycle parking. And I have to add, there are trikes as well. Um, one of the trike guys are very upset that I refer to those trikes as a motorcycle, so I should add that. Just get you here. Um, <laughs> throughout the, uh, the week, we had extra staff on duty as far as uh, I was on duty each day. Uh, Sheriff's Office provided additional resources as well. Um, we had no major incidents as far as uh, serious motor vehicle accidents, no major injuries. Uh, we did have a few arrests. The Sheriff's <coughs> Office was nice enough to provide a, a saturation patrol uh, for um, Sunday, or excuse me, Saturday and Sunday, the 28th and 29th of March. Um, that saturation patrol basically uh, inundated Cave Creek and the surrounding district with extra deputies. Um, Specifically looking out for uh, driving while intoxicated type offenses. And uh, as a result of that, there were five arrests from that, uh, that task force. Uh, periodically throughout the event, uh, I timed the traffic delays. And uh, again, Saturday the 21st and Saturday the 28th were certainly the highest delays when it came to traffic uh, as far as time delays. Um, the largest delay that I personally recorded was on Saturday the 28th, oddly enough. Uh, it was a 17 minute delay. Um, in the westbound direction. And the way I measure the westbound uh, traffic, I begin at Galloway Drive, which is generally where the traffic uh, restriction would occur. Uh, this particular day, the traffic um, restriction, be or the traffic delay began pretty much at the top of the hill at the corner of the uh, Cape Creek Building Supply property. 
Uh, and again, it took me 17 minutes to clear through town. When I say clear through town, I terminate my uh, timing uh, once I leave the traffic delay. The traffic delay was, um, uh, excuse me, until Schoolhouse Road that day. So again, it was 17 minutes. Um, just quick sampling of some of my other time delays. Uh, 17 minutes, again, was, was the longest delay I experienced. Um, on Saturday and Sunday, um, Saturday the 21st, the largest delay I was, I was in was nine minutes. And again, um, it would start from the moment I hit the traffic until I was clear of the event. And for this boundary, I would choose Galloway Drive, which I think we could all agree would be the eastern boundary. And then uh, Schoolhouse Road would be the western <coughs> boundary. Um, there was no delays that seemed to go past that event. Um, we had a, a few minor skirmishes at a few of the bars, which really isn't typical for us. A uh, um, normal price heavy Sunday, we would generally have one or two scuffles at the bars. Uh, so this is nothing that added uh, any huge amount of, uh, of uh, problems to the town um, as far as fights. Again, no major injuries, no serious accidents. And uh, we do receive complaints as far as some people call to complain that the motorcycles are very noisy. Um, we directed traffic for a long time and took a few days for my years to recover. Um, I, I agree that motorcycles are noisy at times. Um, we also have some cars that are noisy in town, uh, so that, that happens. Um, I'll enough, we didn't receive any music complaints. Generally, during bike week, we receive a complaint that music is too loud. We didn't really receive any of those complaints. Um, what I found this year, which was a little strange to me, it seemed to be an earlier crowd. They'd come in, they'd park their motorbikes, go and have their, their lunches or whatever, and then uh, then leave pretty early. Um, and I don't know what to attribute that to. That would be more of a Mark Bradshaw question. But uh, it was definitely an earlier crowd this year than, than years past. Um, as far as volume is concerned, um, I, I would say volume was up this year based on previous years. Um, that's just you know rough estimates of watching the amount of motorbikes coming and going. Uh, we did have a major ride come into town on the 21st, which was the Pat Tillman ride. Um, <coughs> oddly enough, I, I am embarrassed to say I didn't even notice them coming in nor leaving. Um, you know, we just had such a volume of, of people already that nothing really stood out about it. I know there was a, a great deal of people that attended it. Um, I was told it was very well attended and. Uh, <coughs> You know, it, everyone I spoke to, as far as, uh, you know, I spent a, a great deal of my time walking up and down the, the streets. Um, I, I would say every shape, size, and color motorcycle I've ever thought of or dreamt of or had nightmares about was there. I would say that uh, as far as uh, people, um, I run into the same guy from Massachusetts every year for about the past six years. The first time I ran into him, his motorcycle was broken down at 6434 Skate Creek Road. Um, initially, I laughed when I passed him. But then I remember that if he spent money, tax dollars and tax dollars, he was explaining it was important. So I went back and uh, we actually helped him. We got the guy from CLS. Long story short, six years later, this guy still remembers. He comes back every year, which I find interesting. He plans his uh, annual holiday around bike week. And uh, somehow in the sea of nine zillion people, this guy just finds me and, uh, do you remember me? <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. But anyway, that was our bike week. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Questions from the council? I have a couple. Uh, first, uh, I'm sorry. Number, uh, I, was, I walked out of Harold's, I think, at about 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday, and there was a, <laughs> a, 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 a blow up. Uh, I think it was a law tiger that was about three stories high on top of the cat house. Uh, I know it was taken down. Uh, I think Dana said it was uh, not code. Is there anything in our. In our Permit procedure as it exists now that could uh, give us some forewarning when there's going to be, you know, three, four story plastic blow ups on top of the buildings that are in violation of code in town? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I can honestly say that I, I didn't get a phone call from the tap house and say, can we put this up or we will be putting this up. Um, I, I like to say that Bike Week is always full of surprises. That was a larger surprise in normal. Um, <laughs> so there's nothing in our permitting process as it, as, it, as it exists right now that would give us some sort of forewarning that they were going to place three, four-story plastic blow-ups of biker lawyers on top of the building. It is 
uh, prohibited in the town code, and we notified them they removed it immediately. Or, or is there any? I, I, sorry, I, is there a, 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 any sort of a, a ordinance that we have right now, to your knowledge, um, as the special events coordinator, that would uh, have any limitation on the kind of signs that could be placed at the various parking lots and the various venues. Uh, for instance, and I, I don't want to offend anybody here, but I have a citizen sent a picture of a clothing outlet, and I don't want to, let me just, I go. Let me just do a, a, a slide because uh, I think you'll all get it. A bad mother or clothing is, is is that something that is normally uh, in accordance with our code as far as commercial advertising in the town core? I don't believe we have anything in the town code that would allow <laughs> profanity <laughs> or, or, or prohibit. Um, in Cape Creek, we, we tend to believe in decency, and we prefer, obviously, that people have that in common. Um, some of us have the decency, some of us perhaps have a different sense of humor. Uh, perhaps okay. we want to share it, but yeah, you know, I guess there, there could be some debate on that. Um, how about, and, and my nephew uh, is, he's not, he has a motorcycle, and he served two tours in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and he was here, he's still in the armed forces. And, and he went out to bike week and he came back and he was really, and, and a citizen sent me this picture also. He was kind of concerned because he said that the Hells Angels were flying their colors and that is sort of a, a situation that sometimes causes uh, problems. Um, and I wondered if there was any restriction in our uh, special events uh, code or ordinances that precluded, uh, uh, historically at least, outlaw motorcycle gangs. Uh, Flying the colors uh, in the Cape Creek, and it looks like having boots also. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, certainly we did have a motorcycle club had set up, I believe, three separate tables. Um, we do not have anything that precludes that specifically in our town code. Uh, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, three three part question. Uh, actually, a four part. Is there a way to replace that microphone with that microphone? Because I don't think that one's worked for months, and I think this one does. I don't know. I'm New York, but the first time someone says they can't hear me. No, no, well, I can hear you. Like you're facing me, and some of the people in the back might not. Um, thank you. Uh, so I have a three-part question. Uh, the first is, what criteria does the town use to approve um, the roadway restrictions, the kind of roadway restri restrictions that we see on bike week or during trades? Um, how many roadway, uh, how many approved roadway restrictions are there for the balance of the year that, that you're aware of? And um, how are the boundaries of the roadway restrictions determined? And I ask you that in, in particular because it seemed like on both sides of those boundaries, it, it, it may have gone a little too far. I mean, it, seemed, it seemed like there, there wasn't a necessity, possibly, to go out, out as far in one direction or the other. As far as the roadway restrictions are concerned, um, any business in the town of Cape Creek can request a right-of-way permit. We look at the permit. We determine at a staff level if it's something that uh, we think we can pull off without jeopardizing public safety. And if the business articulates a reason for it and we feel that there's some benefit, then we would agree to write the permit. Um, as far as the, the distances, um, it's kind of like when I do a, a permit for a, a parade. When we, when we get the permit for the parade, when we issue that permit, Tracy will come and say, hey, Marshall Stein, um, we think we're going to have X, Y amount of entries. And in my view, everything's done months in advance. And for us, we have to plan for the 110 entries that she had last year. Plus, we'll add a few more for this year because she gets better every year. And we allow enough space in our minds 
that we can stage everything. Um, same thing with Bike Week. Bike Week, uh, Mark Bradshaw and Rick decide that they think that they'll have X amount of motorcycles per day, uh, and they feel that they need X amount of space in order to accommodate those motorbikes. That being said, there's no great science to it, number one. Uh, number two, there's a taper before we have a closure of a right away. So for example, the taper for the, for bike week began just past the, um, the Kiwanis building. So that's a taper for safety reasons. Then they put a traffic control device. In this case, it was the, uh, the flashing sign. And then they put the, the delineators up. Um, so that's a little cushion that they have. Uh, God forbid some drunk idiot comes driving around that corner. Uh, he's going to hit all that before he hits the motorcycles. Um, and again, it's forward and back. So they have it on the east panel and they have it on the west panel. Um, and uh, that's pretty much how we determine the right of closures. Did that adequately answer your question? Uh, yeah. And the uh, remainder of the year, how many oh, sorry. closures do we have? Um, for the remainder of this year, and again, right away, closures are handled through. Uh, to our building safety department. Uh, as far as special event right away permits, I don't believe any more are on the books for this time, as of this time that I'm aware of. Uh, that being said, we have the Balloon Festival coming up, I believe, uh, the, end of, the end of May. No, yeah, the end of May. Um, history, sorry. No, 2nd of May is the uh, home expo. 24th. 24th, all right, so May 24th, pardon me. Um, we have the Balloon Festival. Balloon Festival, we'll see um, possibly, Balloon Festival is one of our most popular events that we have in town, and uh, sometimes we have a way of restrictions for that. Um, I have not, I don't recall if there's been any issued yet, I don't believe there have, but if they sell enough tickets where they believe, generally have buses flowing back and forth, um, there could be some momentary restrictions for that. Um, Obviously, we have right away permits issued for construction, but as far as special events, I, I truly don't recall any other ones other than that um, for the remainder of this year, this calendar, or this budget year. Thank you. You're welcome again. Okay. Uh, Councilman O'Brien. Uh, two questions. <coughs> when, special, when this special event took place, there was a great deal of effort and uh, cost put into traffic control. Who paid for those? Traffic for a special event that um, is put on by a private business like that, the private businesses. So this particular event, the tap house and the uh, highway, um, pay for all the off duty deputies to pay for the traffic control. Approximately, or if you know even better than that, how many citations did you hand out for people running the stop signs at the major intersection? Council Member, I hold respect to. We were so busy. I, I don't. I didn't keep track of that particular. I, I know that we had a tremendous amount of traffic stops throughout the town, um, but how many were issued for one particular violation, I honestly don't know. So if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to query the system and see what I can find and take it Thank you. After my vacation, of course. Councilman, that's her question. Adam, I had two phone calls and one visit from a home of uh, a business owner. Yes. And the question was, and I think she's here tonight, is the monitors you referenced that were hired by, the, by Mark and others uh, allowed certain cones to give an ingress egress in their business? This particular business doesn't have that big a shop or a parking there. And unfortunately, once they got in, is the bikers would come up and it's a show, and they want to make sure their bike gets seen. They put it in the row and they move the cone. In a couple of instances, not only did the business owner lose business, they had people trapped in there that couldn't get out. And they do a good job of trying to get them to move, but after they're trapped in a business, it's very difficult to identify the owner of the bike and ask them to move it so they can get out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's hard to do because there's hundreds. Yeah, Mayor Vice Mayor, Trust uh, Throughout the entire bike week, I, I am up and down the entire roadway, presumably times. Maybe not presumably, but a lot. And uh, one of the things I look for, we do have two particular businesses I've requested that motorcycles not be allowed to park in front of their businesses. So even though the highway and the tap house take to the right of way, 
um, we have different signage that goes up and we don't allow motorbikes to park in front of those particular businesses because they feel it's detrimental to their business. Throughout my entire patrol, um, I did not witness those two businesses being blocked in at all. I'm not going to say that motorcycles didn't come to their boundaries and maybe get out and move a cone and encroach um, you know, a couple of parking spaces. Um, I would say beyond a reasonable doubt that probably happened. But as far as blocking their entire parking lot, I did not witness that at all, nor was that reported to me. What was reported to me was they would get out, they would move the, the cones and say no parking, and of course, you know, you give them three inches and they take a foot. Um, I did hear of that, but I, I don't believe any of those businesses were, were fully blocked off during my you know. Okay, good enough. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, what do you think could be done to move traffic through town a little bit faster, particularly for the residents who are trying to get to church or bashes, or particularly on the peaks of the um, weekend? What do you think can be done based on your experience? Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor Kesselman, I've been in Marshall for 13 years. Bike has grown um, throughout those 13 years. The sheer volume of people that we have in town, um, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. What we tried to do this year as, at the request of council, um, I sat down with the lieutenant in charge of the traffic control that was working off duty for these companies, and uh, I asked him, I said, you know what, normally we, we try and get uh, seven or eight cars through before we stop traffic. We try and get 15 cars through at a time. And there becomes a point where there's just so many people um, crowding in that some knucklehead is always going to step out and they cause a, a larger problem. So although, although we try to get as many cars through as possible, um, the sheer volume of traffic we have causes delays. Uh, like I said, the, the longest delay this particular bike week was 17 minutes that I recorded. Um, on a Saturday and Sunday, I mean, I'm looking at Saturday the 21st, I see eight minutes and nine minutes jumping out of me um, throughout the day on the 21st. On the 28th, the uh, longest delay again was 17 minutes. Not only enough, that occurred from uh, 5:30 to to 6 o'clock, or excuse me, 5:45 to 6 o'clock in the westbound direction. So I don't know if someone was exiting one of the uh, businesses at that time. We, we we try the best we can to expedite traffic. Um, we certainly know that in order for bike week to succeed, the residents have to allow it, and we try and work well with the residents. We try and work well with the, with the businesses as well. Uh, we try our hardest to try and expedite traffic as best we can. Um, there are going to be delays. The sheer volume of people, we will have delays. We try our hardest. We have more than enough manpower on staff to uh, to help expedite the traffic. But again, just the sheer volume of people and the fact that we have people parking on either side. Um, you know, you have people that, that want to park at, at the Hogs and Horses so they can get over to the, the uh, highway. It, it's just a, a nature of how many people we have. Right. It was my experience that it seemed as though it was the pedestrians were getting up. I was in line for 12 minutes and I got up to that main intersection and one motorcycle and one car went by. Mm -hmm. I sat there for about a minute and a half, literally almost two minutes. The officer is very nice, but he was waiting and waiting. When people come out of a bar and they're going to walk, you can't anticipate <clears throat> I did pull up to his side and said to him, you know, you need to let more cars go through. And he said, I, and I could tell he was hot, I could tell he was tired. Um, am I not doing a, a good job? And I said, if you want to go from good to great, I said, why don't you try and let at least six to eight cars, because it is coming west and going east. And there's anywhere from at any given time that I went and made myself go out there and do it, uh, 45 to 50 cars, almost consistently on the weekend. So if you're going to use the <coughs> ruler, being, we're trying to let six to eight cars, let them wait a little bit, and then we'll have a bigger group to bring them across. I think that it has gotten much better over the last few years because you have <laughs> less places to cross. So people do get through faster, the communication is better, but it would be nice if <coughs> Um, I have another one that, um, another question. Um, well, 
that actually wouldn't have to do with you, so I won't ask that question. You can blame me anyway if you like. <laughs> no, because I don't think you know the financials of uh, the income for that week. I don't know if we have that information that we can, because that's what people, at least from our viewpoint, you know, is it worth what everybody goes through? So, and, and I think that's something we need to know and understand. Thank you. Additional questions from Council Councilman McGuire. Yes, and this is a question for Randy and Ian. Some of our citizens may not realize the long term plans and alternate ways of count of traffic in the town. Would you briefly tell us what you're looking at in terms of the routes of traffic going through town that will help to alleviate some of these uh, issues? Thank you for Members of the Council, um, staff is continually working on alternate routes, uh, specifically uh, military road connecting. Uh, there's a large parcel of land that's called the uh, former Christian Pageant Grounds. We're working with people who own the property to try and get dedication so that we can open up a road through there for such purposes, emergency access. Uh, also, continually working with Mr. Bob Kite on his property to get access between the schoolhouse and basin. Uh, that may come, maybe not sooner, but in the next couple of years as he develops the property. Uh, uh, we are always working on those things. It's identified in the town court plan, and we uh, meet with people and see what we can do to get those passed up and done. Yeah. If, if I might, since this item is now more than something that's not on the agenda, if council wishes more information or discussion <coughs> further on it, actually it comes on a future agenda. The issue relates to future improvements to the road. Anything else from the council? Additional questions? Anything else, Marcia? No, thank you for your time. Just a question regarding financial. Will be those results in probably two months from the OR? So how many others? Okay, uh, there is public comment on this. North Grapevine Road, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and House members. My husband and I bought a house on Long Mountain Road, South Long Mountain Road, in 1995, thinking it was from Cape Creek. When we found that we, had simply, that we simply had a Cape Creek mailing address, we chose to move within the town limits because we liked the citizens, the eclectic shops, the wildlife, and the open space. We became involved in town activities and nonprofits and worked on the committee to preserve the Fur Cross Ranch. We love this town and want to live here as long as we can, but we do not want to live in Sturgis South for eight or more days each year. Chapter 114 of the Town Code says that all special events, whether public or private property, should be limited to a maximum of four consecutive days per event, unless a longer period of time is requested from and granted by the Town Council in advance. Bike Week began on March 21st and ended on March 29th. Did this council or the previous council approve the longer period of time? If not, this was violated. We have the misfortune of getting our mail delivered to the post office. I have to get on the Cape Creek Road from Gallery Drive. That in itself can sometimes be a challenge. And I have to drive through all the motorcycles and pedestrians in a long line of cars until I reach the post office 10 or so minutes late. Ten minutes to go one mile. Then there is the return trip, trying to get on Cape Creek Road from the post office and worrying about people running the stop sign and four or more motorcycles going through at once. What about our health, safety, and welfare? Why do we even have lane closures at all? I personally don't recollect them being any longer both in the last few years. Mm -hmm. We don't close lanes for the third and fourth of July. Parking is a nightmare there, but everyone loves the parlor. And they put up with the traffic. Don't approve the special event permit if we have to close the lanes. Part of the way on, on some of hogs and horses' property. <coughs> have TC open up his gates to go from the tap house to his property and put the vendors there. And park the bikes where they belong in the tap house parking lot. 
He used a Western term, rein it in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carrick. Ms. Carrick. <coughs> no other speakers. Does anyone else? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Kerry Smith, resident of Cave Creek. Just a couple of short suggestions. First, when businesses put up large inflatable signs or violate the code associated with permits, there's a simple way to resolve this. When you give a permit, ask the entities requesting the permit to post a bond. If they violate the terms of the permit, the bond is kept. Make the bond large enough, they'll pay attention to inflatable items that you put on the top. Second, following up on the lady who spoke before me, the roadway is a public resource. When we allocate lanes of that public resource to one set of businesses to benefit their activities, that's a good thing for them. And they certainly defray some of the costs associated with managing the traffic. But it creates a negative effect on other businesses. Lay aside the citizens it creates a negative effect on other businesses. Okay, why don't we share the wealth? If the Tap House, the Chip, Harold's, the rest of them, the hideaway benefit as a result of this, share the revenues that are associated with that benefit with the community, with the towns, businesses that lose revenue, establish a sharing rule. I think we find that we would limit the number of days of these events very quickly. And we might find we didn't need lane closure if lane closures were conditional on revenue sharing. Create incentives and you get responses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, did you My name is Lori Stoutenberg. I'm a business owner and I'm a homeowner in Cave Creek. I came to the creek about five years ago during bike week and I moved here because of what a fun town this is. I own two different businesses that both thrive during the motorcycle industry of bike week. I make most of my revenue during that time that carries me through the dead months of the summer. Um, I personally know that uh, the highway does pay extra funds to have the patrol, the officers, um, park motorcycles and have people walk back and forth across the street there. I was also working with Hogs and Horses this year and I know we generated a ton of revenue by having vendors come in. Not only that, but I have 11 different friends from three different states come in Cave Creek and pay for hotels, um, meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I personally ate at the Horny Toad six times, which I never do during the year. And not only that, but I, I pay for my employees to come in from out of um, out of town during bike week to work for me. So the amount of revenue that is generated during this time, I also live in the core of Cave Creek, in the historic core, and I did not want to promote bike week until I knew, I knew that I owned a piece of land here. And since I have been promoting over the last couple of years, I have seen this rally grow so much that it has, it has put Cave Creek on the map, and then some. So I am very grateful to be a part of this community and I'm sorry if there's a little bit of discomfort with traffic, but you know what? If 10 minutes out of your day is too much to ask for a little bit of extra revenue, I happen to live on a dirt road. We need that revenue to help improve our town. And it does not take more than 10 minutes to go another way. And I know if you live off of Schoolhouse, you can go by way of Fleming Springs. You can go around Scottsdale Road. There's a back road behind Hogs and Horses. I'm sorry, but you know, I don't complain when the PGA has their, their golf tournament down in Scottsdale and I'm inconvenienced for 10 minutes coming up Scottsdale Road. You know, and over the course of 20 years, this town is gonna to grow and things just need to accommodate. And I'm, I'm here because of it. I love this town and I'd like to see it grow. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment is still open. <clears throat> yes. I, I, I'll have you next week. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, someone came up with this suggestion, like, why not contact Sturgis? 
and find out how they, as a community, deal with what their life week. I mean, most of the residents leave town, they rent their homes. And that's not what we're about. But why not reach out and try and find out some information about how they deal with life week? Comment number one. Comment number two. Why is a lot split on the consent agenda? Thank you. Mr. Vail. Council, Vice Council, Honorable, Honorable Council Members, I'm Bill Vail and Alan Harrells. And uh, I just would like to comment to the fine residents of Cape Creek here is that prior to Walmart open, Harold's was the largest taxpayer here in town. And relative to the other comments I hear, I don't think anybody here wants property taxes, okay? And we need special events here in town to preclude all of us from paying property taxes. And I will tell you that Bike Week, I probably have more complaints from our regular customers than you have here at Town Hall, Town Hall, <laughs> right? However, the, the follow-up comment was, Bill, if it's good for you, we'll avoid the town, we'll come back after the event is over, okay? Which is, which is a wonderful testimony to the 80 years Harold's has been in business, and they did come back. They come back today. They come back for Easter. And I think the, the thing that we lose is it's a week. It's a week out of 52, and it's great for the town. It's exposure for the town, all right? We have people come up here who've never been to Cape Creek before, and they'll come back again, we all hope. So I think if we all sit here and say, okay, do we want property taxes without special events? Then let's do away with Bike Week. Let's buy into the snoring news. All right, banning motorcycles, but that's not what we're all about. This is a special place, and let's keep it a special place. And one week a year, all right, I don't think we should really be complaining because I deferred all those complaints, and those people are all back at Harold's, and I think they'll all be back to the other business here in town. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Anna Marcello, Cape Creek. Since 1999, I could show you the headlines for the local newspapers. It was always about bike week and the road closure and the traffic. It's, it's the same conversation year after year. Um, I love events coming to the historic core. It means you may not upzone more of the Cape Creek carefree intersection, turning that into a Bell Road in order to get sales receipts. But I also believe that speakers like Sue Mueller had valid points. Um, Bill Vail, I love you dearly, but bringing in Bike Week does not preclude a property tax coming to the town of Cape Creek. But maybe something that could work, and if Terry and all the other merchants could, you know, think about this, rent the Bob Kite property and put all the white tents, put all the vendors there in one spot and leave your parking for what parking is for, the bikers, and leave our roads open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Marcella. <laughs> Terry Smith, 26th Street, Cape Creek. Mayor Council, I've been here 
and there's a lot of, quite a few years and uh, I've seen the town and it's always been a little kind of a tourist town, a bar town and it's a town core that I think most everybody moves here to enjoy and what keeps it that as we found out in the last recession when we started getting empty buildings up and down our street when the people stopped coming here and I give credit uh, a lot to the boom coming in to Buffalo Chip for their bow, bow riding uh, to the hideaway bringing the motorcycle people in who then bring their families back up here in their Mercedes or Lexus or whatever it may be but it makes our town thrive it makes the businesses thrive I think some residents would like to see our cute little town and nobody in it except for them to come drive down and, and look at it to keep those businesses going to keep them prospering we do need events and yes there's going to be some inconveniences I think it is a good thing that the town is looking for alternative routes for residents I think it's going to take an education process once they get in place but I think that we need to enjoy that our town is thriving that it, it is not what it was just a few years ago in the recession when there was hardly anybody in town, when our town was actually dying. Um, so we should celebrate it. Yes, there's going to be problems, there's going to be things to work out, but in general we have to make sure that we don't turn into our neighbor. Our neighbor has excluded motorcycles, our neighbor has excluded horses, our neighbor has excluded everybody over in Carefree except for the ones who like to drink wine or buy art. And if we want to exclude all mountain bikers we are a town of everything we are cactus huggers mountain bikers hikers horse people mountain motorcycles we are we accept everyone in our town and yes everyone has to put up a little bit with the other person i have to put up with mountain bikers you might say on a trail um and the, you know the hikers have to put up with the horses you might say and we as residents have to put up with our special events so um, yes the town needs to control things but to start saying we want to get rid of one factor or another I think would be a disaster for our town thank you hello Taylor Cummins proud resident of Cape Creek at 6018 East Old Memorial Place I didn't have to say that last time uh, I've been inspired to speak a little bit basically just like he said it's about dealing with each other just because i don't ride a motorcycle doesn't mean that i should just dislike the fact that motorcycles take over the town for one week it's like one week it's not every day it's just one week it does drive a huge economy that we can't even quantify because this just reverberates uh i sold a bike to somebody because they stopped before they got to the big party on the entertainment district and the guy really liked the way that it matched his motorcycle colors. So, I mean, <laughs> you never know where you're going to get your money from. You just have to try to draw people to this town. And so if we're going to try to stop people from coming here and shoot ourselves in the foot, I definitely have to say I'm against that. Um, it's not just about what you personally want. Each one of us, if we're mountain bikers, of course we want to shut down the streets for mountain bikes. But I don't want the hot air balloon people to do that. That's what it seems like to me, is that everybody wants their own individual you know requirements fulfilled but when it comes to a community we do have to put up with each other and shutting down the road plan ahead all right you know it's not like it's all day every day if you have to get somewhere in carefree i would just take carefree highway i went up north on tom darlington and i got to the same place it took an extra five minutes and it's just plan ahead so it's not that big of a deal to wait i know that we want instantaneous gratification because of our iphones but it is okay to wait in traffic do the town core maybe taking a view of the lovely you know businesses you drive by at a slow pace instead of going 40 miles an hour through Cape creek so yeah let's not slow down the input of people coming here and as much as i dislike the noise or whatever bike week is a huge asset to this town so don't try to stop anything with it Hello again, I'm Tracy Casali, president of Cape Creek Fiestas and the Cape Creek Party Association. I think that this is a very slippery slope that some of us probably don't want to go down. It isn't about bike week, it's about special events. 
We just had our 38th annual Cape Creek Fiesta's Rodeo, and it was a tremendous success. It was probably, from the feedback we're getting, the best parade this town's ever seen. And when it comes to traffic control, and when it comes to organizing, we're, we, the rodeo people, are all volunteers, and we do this year-round. I have never seen better traffic control and more help, and I did this year for Marshall Stein and his team. It was amazing. Him and I were in communication. I, mean, I was on a horse the entire time when the incident that he discussed. It, this year, I mean, smiles, friendly, helpful. I didn't see anyone frowning the entire parade route. It was a very enjoyable day for this town. But it is a special event. So is Bike Week. So is Wild West Days. So is the Balloon Festival. All of these entities throughout the year, this town needs. We're a very small town doing very big things. Let's do teamwork, stay together, and make sure we keep improving. Thank you. Uh, public comment is still open. Uh, good people, we're now in 15 minutes into our meeting, and we're still on agenda item number one. So <coughs> just, just a couple more people here. I need to move the rest of the meeting along with the council. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? Mr. Bachelor. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council. Um, my name is Mark Bradshaw, owner of the Highway Grill and Tap House. I live right over here in the commercial court, 6220 East Mark Way. Uh, so I'm in the court as well. This year's bike week, I think we had you know, more people than we've ever had up here. Um, I think Adam did a great job with the, with the <laughs> Over the years, we've learned how to deal with, um, with the traffic issues and so forth. Not to say we've perfected it by all means, but we're definitely willing to learn and, and talk amongst each other uh, as the restaurant owners and so forth, or, or even take uh, you know advice from some of the residents and so forth. So any suggestions that you have that will make it easier for us, we do appreciate. So, um, sorry if we make some of the residents upset or whatever. I don't think of 17 minutes is that long uh, to, to get through town. Um, so, but if there's anything that we can do to make bike week better, in working with the rodeo or whatever, we're all over here. So. We appreciate it from both Jim and I, um, as far as business owners in town. Thanks. Thank you. One, one more speaker, please. Sorry, it's brief. Um, my name's Larry Elliott. I own Rakes Magazine. Um, that's all over the Valley for Arizona. I travel to bike events all over the, all over the world. Um, what Sturgis does is put portable walkways up over the venue, so if everybody's parking in hogs and horses, they walk over and then they some traffic. So, any suggestion you might look at. Thank you. Okay, for the uh, record, uh, Larry Went, the owner of the Buffalo Chip, is in the hospital and for surgery. We did submit comments. I'll turn it over to Carrie so the public record. I mean, bring this back to council real quick. Uh, comment about voting on that. Let me just start down here. Uh, first of all, I appreciate everybody's comments. I think Bike Week is, is awesome. Um, I think there are things that can be done to make it better overall for the town, and I, I appreciate Mr. Bradshaw's uh, uh, openness to discussing those things and, and seeing if we can't make traffic better and, and uh, uh, you know, keep things safe and, and uh, prosperous for everybody in town. But by no means, uh, I'm all going to speak for myself, but I don't think anyone up here is, is promoting the idea that we, you know, the town will remain a bike week. So you can all three decide. Councilman Lamar. Larry Lamar, Lamar, Like Councilman Lipsky, I want to thank everyone who spoke up tonight. This gives us a, a broad view of how our citizens and our businesses feel and your experiences. And it's from information like this that we can plan for the future. So that as these events take place, we can do the best possible job taking into account all of the 
issues that you've brought up tonight and deal with them. I also want to cite that Mr. Wint, in the letter that uh, he had passed out to us, said that in nine days he had generated over $15,000 in taxes and sales taxes to the town of Cave Creek. That's the address. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Messer. Well, a little bit of conflict. I've been here for almost 28 years, watched the town grow. My wife and I don't go to the core during special events. There's just too much traffic. In the early days, we used to bring everybody up here and look. My mother especially loved carefree. But having said that, I think I've heard tonight from the citizens like Sue. I think Mark has a touch of class. And uh, I think we need a solution. But I don't know what it is. Man, a few words. I enjoy special events in town. Um, and contrary to what some people think, I, I think this is a, a really good one. When people come up here and enjoy themselves on a special event weekend, they remember it and they turn around and come back later. There's residual effects, there's residual sales to everybody whenever, whenever these events go on. Um, down the road, um, Years ago, when our kids were little, we would we would come up here because there was a fair kind of thing up here. And look what you ended up with—you got stuck with me for ten years. Up here. <laughs> well, I think it's this type of synergy of people getting up and expressing themselves that creates, I think, for some folks, an aha moment. I think the gentleman who spoke with regards to what Stu just said, because that question was asked is a step towards finding solutions to concerns that folks have. You know, seventeen minutes the first time wasn't too difficult, but when you leave your house late, then seventeen minutes is quite a bit. Um, and it is really more about the traffic, is what I sense more than now. I have a nephew brothers and both of them ride motorcycles. And my brother up in Utah is changing his colors. So I have a little insight to it. Um, and I think the other perception is, is that folks who ride motorcycles are not all into drugs and that they're not criminals in what they do. As we've heard spoken more than once, uh, many of those bikes are very expensive and there were some beautiful bikes. Um, I think there are a lot of questions to be asked and I think I should come back later with some of the solutions that may come forward from um, planning. There's a solution to it. But I'm all for special events. Um, we enjoy them. I'm the first one to run down and put my chair right where I would like to sit at 8.30 in the morning. So, not necessarily the bike week, but um, <laughs> but I think they'll come up with solutions to that. Yeah, I don't think let me concur with council. I don't think anybody up here is, is uh, thinking or desiring that we uh, do away with special events. I was I'm not bragging, but I was a I was a bronze sponsor of the, of the Fiesta de Rodeos personally. Not, aside from the, the great support that the town and, and uh, Adam Stein did, so uh, and we've been invested in that for a long time. I will say this: the bike week takes up almost twice. The de days of closures, then all of the other events, special event closures in town. Uh, and some of the citizens have talked about you know, our public roads being a resource. They are, and they are for transportation. Anytime you have road closures, you have, and this is just a fact, you have the opportunity for more accidents, more conflicts, more confusion, uh, uh, and more problems. Uh, I think Adam Stein talked about, you know, the whole bunch of, of, of traffic violations. So the issue here is not so much the special rights and not so much parking, but the issue is the parking. Yeah. And and uh, allowing citizens to still have use of the town to get to the post office and the hospital perhaps um, and have special events. And as creative as the town core businesses are, and as much open space there is around the entertainment center around there, 
coupled with uh, Mr. Kite's property, I, I've got to believe that, that there can be creative solutions that give folks a place to enjoy the, their, all their bikes together uh, and recreate uh, and still have our roads uh, open for travel as they should be. So I'm looking for a balance going forward. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, if you just look over the past couple of years, the past few years, King Creek has experienced quite a bit of success with the special events, and we can applaud that and appreciate it. At the same time, with success comes challenges, and now we are experiencing those challenges. I haven't heard anything here this evening um, that would lead me to uh, seek uh, restrictions, solutions where they need to be, creative ideas where they need to be, making something better, making it less uh, congested, perhaps, or rethinking it. All those things are, are very doable. doable. So we need to move this along here. Council discussion, uh, this is agenda item number two. An appointment of a resident to fill vacancy on the zoning board of adjustment with a term ending December 31, 2017. Ian? Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, the uh, board of adjustment had a vacancy caused by board member Richard Pellow and his wife Lee moving out of town. We have one applicant, the physician Jay Johnson. Uh, I don't know Mr. Johnson, so I don't know if he's here or not. I'm here. Now I know Mr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council members. I've lived in Cape Creek now for about a year and a half. Uh, I guess you could say I admired it from afar before then. So I have uh, an appreciation for its unique character and charm. I have, uh, well, I, I therefore want to serve very much this community. I've practiced law in Arizona in excess of 20 years, and culminating in my position now as General Counsel of the Central Arizona Project. I'm not an expert on property matters, but certainly have dealt with them periodically over my career, and understand the occasional need, given the circumstances or characteristics of a particular parcel of land, to sometimes consider and approve uh, a variance so um, I know that I can work with the other members of the Board of Adjustment and fairly administer applications. Any questions for me? Any questions from Council? Thank you, Mr. A question, Council? No. Oh. <coughs> one a question? I have one. I just can't have too many lawyers. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Not too many good ones, sir. Yeah, but my friends are right. Thank you. It, it looks like they would um, actually be great right count on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. There is public comment on the general meeting. Let me bring that back to council. Nominations are open. Thank you, Mr. Council. I nominate Mr. Jay Johnson for the position of the board of adjustment. Thank you. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further nominations? Hearing and seeing none, nominations are closed. Councilman McGuire, you have been, uh, made a motion. I also am impressed by your resume, Mr. Johnson, and thank you for coming forward. Thank you for joining us in this wonderful community, and thank you for putting up with the little extension we had in the previous item. Welcome, <laughs> and uh, we look forward to having you. Thank you. And Councilman, that's what you have second. Uh, I'm impressed with your background and experience. You will serve the community well. I'm glad you moved here. Thank you, sir. Anything else from council? All those in favor of the nomination, please say no. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes clearly have it. Congratulations, Mr. Johnson. Thank you all very much. Item three: presentation by Mandy Lord, sales planner, discussion with town council on the Cape Creek Gateway Trail project. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Thank you for this opportunity to give you an update on this uh, trail project, the Gateway Trail Project. Before I go on, I just wanted to add to what the Mayor said earlier about our uh, open space 
uh, Trail Run, the Cooper Trail Run. It was our sixth year, and uh, we did have close to 300 runners. And to date, uh, this race has um, raised close to $80,000 for the acquisition of open space. So um, I want to thank everybody that participated in the event and just our Saturday and also the last six years. We've had quite a few members. So, um, and then special thanks to Corinna because she really has been at the head of it for six years. Mm. So the Gateway Trail, this trail has been on the Talons Trail now for since 2005. And it's, we could raise that up just a little bit, Ryan. It's, it actually starts at Carefree Highway. And south, just south of the Carefree, or Carefree Highway is that bridge uh, that defines the jurisdictional boundary between, thank you, Dick, between uh, Cave Creek and the Sonoran Preserve. So this trail has been our trail map. And, um, So anyway, over it, it, as many years as it's been on the map, I've been to regional trail meetings, and we've talked about this with the city of Phoenix, and now they have completed their, their trail to the edge of our jurisdictional boundary. So now it's kind of our turn. And the Desert Foothills Mountain Bike Association uh, came to us and uh, Okanagan Trails Construction, Matt Woodson, and REI. And they have offered their labor and their time and their money to help us build this trail. In return, we as a town, some of the members are also here tonight, including the President, Lorraine Winter, and she may speak to this a little bit later, but um, what we'd like to do is, is develop this trail to connect the Sonora Preserve it will go through the water ranch site, through Track C, which is also owned by the town. And that opens up to the BLM land and the Cape Creek Regional Park. And this trail will connect then to the um, Miracle Regional Trail, the open space, Spur Cross Ranch Conservation, the Tonto National Forest, and even more important, it will legally connect our community. So it's an exciting project, and I'm just going to bring it forward to uh, let the council know we'd like to do this in October, in the fall, 2015, if we can. And uh, we'll entertain any questions you may have. Questions from council. Council Tammy, when we discussed this, I think we described it as a gateway. I think so. And if I were to ride a horse, how far could I go? So long as your horse can go. <laughs> You'd probably be tired before the horses wear out. It could go, it opens a gateway to hundreds of miles of trails. Beautiful. That's all I had. Council McGuire, question. Yes. Rebecca, do you have experience in hiking this Sonoran Preserve, which is a new part of the Phoenix Parks with extensive trails? I have not actually. Part of the financial responsibility on the town's part will be for the survey of the property line. And um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the Illinois community here in the REI and the Phil's Mountain Bike Association is going to be part of it. I have one quick question. Maybe you said it, and I can sort of get ignorant. Who is responsible for um, keeping it clean as people go through and drop stuff off and stuff sure. happen? Well, we have several trails throughout the town, and I think we have a lot of good trail stewards. Generally, other stuff on the trail, that we don't have an actual plan, but everybody's pretty good about that kind of thing. Well, once it becomes a problem, I, I don't see a reason to put in a plan, but we'll certainly take a look at that. Well, there is a public comment. I think Lorraine was going to speak. Yeah. 
Good evening. My name is Lorraine Montori. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am the president of the Desert Foothills Mountain Bike Association. Several of our members are here tonight. We are a 501c3 chapter of the International Mountain Bike Association. And our mission is to enhance the mountain bike experiences in the North Phoenix <coughs> Valley. But the majority of our work is done right here in Cave Creek. Our club donated almost 600 hours of volunteer work on Cave Creek trails in 2014, and almost 200 hours so far this year. This effort is directed by our board member and trail ambassador, Ernie Weaver. In support of our mission, we approached the town with the possibility of building the Cave Creek Gateway Trail. It would connect the Phoenix and Orange Preserve to our Cave Creek trails to allow connectivity to our parks, the Maricopa Trail, Tonto National Forest, and trails up as far as Prescott. The trail would truly be a gateway for our town. It would be located entirely on town property, about a mile long, provide safe on-trail travel between the Phoenix Preserve and the Cave Creek trails, and link hundreds of miles of multi-use trails. We all know it's connectivity of trails that makes a system truly successful and our town unique. The potential benefit of this trail has won the support of our partners, REI and Matt Woodson from Okanagan Trail Construction. Both have agreed to donate toward making the Cape Creek Gateway Trail a real reality. Okanagan will prepare the trail corridor and REI and our club will recruit and support the volunteers who would finish the trail by hand. Assuming the town eventually approves of this project, this trail building event will happen on Saturday, October 17th of this year. Although we are a mountain bike club, this trail is for the benefit of all users. Long distance runners, endurance equestrians, and mountain bikers will especially appreciate the connectivity and safety this trail will provide between the two areas. We'd like the building of this trail to be a community effort and invite all of you to join us. It's amazing to see how much work can be done in a few hours with expert direction and willing volunteers, especially if they know there's great food, cold beverages, and a free t-shirt at the end of their volunteer work. <laughs> To help us with the cost of building the Cave Creek Gateway Trail, our club is holding a fundraising event on May 2nd at the new local Johnny's. We invite you to join us. Or if you can't, uh, can't join us, information to allow you to help us is available here and will be at the town hall. Thank you very much for your consideration. So, Mayor Frances, wanted to say that this was my third year to volunteer for the Cape Creek Trail Run. Corinda is probably at home now, already planning the next year's <laughs> trail run. She is phenomenal. Her attitude, I give out packets and the numbers, and we were at REI this year. And the participants, they're all so excited, and a lot of them hadn't even heard of Cape Creek, and that's what's so exciting. Again, bringing people here without upzoning or changing our neighborhood is always so wonderful. But when you have a chance, thank Karina. She's just really a special individual. Thank you. Public comment is to Wilton. In a horse person, <clears throat> I do appreciate the mountain bikers. I have been riding on the trails and had to, I mean, the opportunity to witness them fixing them up, and they have done a great job on the Maricopa County Trail. I've seen in several places, and I hate to say it, but most horse people just walk over it. These mountain bikers make things better. So I say hurrah for them. <laughs> Me again. I'm just inspired here tonight. Uh, 
like Mount Lorraine said, it is all about connectivity, and a lot of endurance mountain bikers that I ride with, it's about about a 35 mile ride, which would actually bring people from Beam Hills, like Deer Valley and I-17, would be one continuous connection to Cape Creek Regional Park. And once they see that one little glimpse on the end of their ride to go back home, they're going to want to come back here. So any type of connectivity we can get to our lovely namesake, Cape Creek Regional Park, it would be benefited big time because if we can just show them a glimpse of what we have, I just saw a Kiva monster in Cape Creek Park the other day. It's just amazing, right? So we know that if we can show that to other people in any way, shape, or form, it's worth the extra manpower. Sometimes it does take some cash, but most of the time it is just hard work. And we would love to see you out there on the trail with us. Other comments, Mr. Walter? <coughs> Patrick Hintzel, um, Bambi, I'm hoping that this will be available on the website, um, your presentation. Oh, sure. Great, thank you. Public uh, comments from the Let me bring this count back to count. Council is taking no action on this. Well, I just had a quick question because um, that really opens up to some um, uninhabited areas. What happens if there's an emergency on the trail way up away from most individuals? I mean, most people do have um, a cell phone, and I don't know how a cell phone is up as you get further up, but what normally could take place? <laughs> Uh, it is actually quite a bit closer than Safe Spur Cross or the Tana National Forest, and um, if your cell phone doesn't work, it can be a problem. But generally, if there's other users on the trail, they can get to somebody and they'll have either NCSO or a helicopter flying in. I've seen that in a couple of different trials, too. So we have to experience that. Yes, yeah. we have. Okay. Okay, discussion council, anything on this? Councilman McGuire. Yeah, I think to answer your question, uh, Councilwoman Clancy, if I may. Sure. Uh, I had an experience a couple of years ago where a fellow unfortunately had a major heart attack on one of the trails. It was actually on the north side of Elephant Mountain, and I was in cell phone contact for about 40 minutes, and the helicopter came in. There are some places in Spur Cross where it is difficult to get. Uh, cell phone contact in some of the lower places, but we have uh, amazing coverage. If you've got it up there, you're going to have it almost anywhere in Cape Creek. Thank you. Councilman Nessler. One quick question. Bambi, does it go under the bridge? Yes, it does. So there's no danger right here? Um, Councilman, uh, answer no. The, the bridge is, on the other is like a big shady area. You can have a picnic under it. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I just want to say um, that it's a really exciting project. It's it's great to hear and sign me up for October. Thanks. Thank you. Only because you love Good work, man. Let's go on to agenda item number four. Council discussion. And approval of resolution R2015-12, attorney intent to form the Hobbs Spring Utilities District. Thank you, members of the council. Mr. Mark Staff is here on behalf of the Copper Spring Subdivision and the project to present their proposal to form the utility district uh, to complete the next phase in the project. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, for the record, my name is Mark Sapp, 3912 North 54th Street, Phoenix. I am president of Cahaba Springs Development Corporation, the owner of Cahaba Springs. Um, most of you know this project fairly well from the years that we've been working on it. Some of you are not as quite uh, familiar with it. Before I get started, though, Carrie, I have to tell you the final score. Thanks, Okay. Sorry. This no, no, no. Boy, give me my condolences. I'm not saying it. Vice Mayor, I'm not going to say it. We'll just ignore the shirt that you're wearing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm recording at least. Oh. 
Yeah, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, I'm here before you to uh, request your uh, approval of a um, special utility district. Um, and uh, if I can, forming the district uh, for the sole purpose of putting in public utilities. If I can, have you go to the next slide, please. Uh, with me today are um, several people that um, have been working with us on the creation of this district and the proposal itself. Mr. William Hicks, who is a attorney at Ballard Spars, does bond work, um, knows your attorneys well, um, all of them, both your bond counsel as well as your town counsel. Mr. Greg Schwartz with Piper Jaffrey, who has represented the town previously in the sale of bonds for both your water and wastewater treatment facilities. So he's quite familiar with this. He would be the, uh, the banker underwriting these and selling them. Um, and then Susan Gamage, who is an attorney at Gamage and Burr, who's our attorney, and she's also a uh, uh, resident of the town of Cape Creek as well. So they're here to, to answer questions about the technical aspects of this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our request of the council is um, to allow the formation of a special district to finance construction of off-site public improvements supporting the development of Cahaba Springs. Uh, next, please. Uh, the proposed district boundaries are limited to the land that we own. There are no other properties included in this district, which means there are no other properties that are impacted by this except for the land that we specifically and, and directly own. Um, and that shows the boundary for some of the council members not familiar with Cahaba Springs, we are on the north side of Cave Creek uh, Recreation Park. Um, and the property is, was it, 1,000 acres. Uh, 230 of it has been gifted or given to the town. About three and a half miles of trails have been gifted to either the county or the town. Um, the project has been moving along for years, stopped by the recession. And now we are proceeding again. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a aerial photograph showing the property boundary on it. You can see to the <coughs> southwest Cape Creek Recreation Area, to the north is Spur Cross Ranch Conservation Area. We sit right smack between the two of them. Between us is state trust lands. Um, so we are the hole in that proverbial dome, if you will. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows our master plan. And it also shows the limits uh, of the proposed district itself. Um, although the improvements to be made are outside of, for the most part, the boundaries of this district. So what we're talking about is constructing improvements that are truly public improvements in the public rights of way to support the development of this project, but also supports uh, residents along the, uh, the uh, 26th Street alignment where we've already installed water lines. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? Um, this is private financing of public improvements. Um, it's not a liability of the town. It's a long-term financing for us. It places financial burden only on those who benefit, and that is us and the residents of that, that uh, project as we develop it. Next slide, please. Who controls the district? Well, initially, uh, what we are proposing is a three-person board with representatives from the landowners within the district. Ultimately, this district gets turned over to the residents of the community itself. Um, we've been discussing with your uh, bond council some issues that they have with this, and what we have suggested to them is we're quite comfortable turning this over to the residents of the, the uh, district. I mean, if there's enough of them to do anything. And so our proposal is to form it, put in the infrastructure, turn it over to the residents as quickly as we can. Next slide, please. The benefits of the district, we get to construct public facilities, uh, accelerate the construction schedule, meaning move this thing along faster than we would otherwise. Um, this is truly growth paying for growth, and there's no town contingent liability in this proposal. And uh, both our uh, underwriter as well as our bond council can speak to those issues as well. Next slide, please. So what are we uh, proposing to finance here? Um, Completion of the 12-inch water line along 26th Street from Joy Ranch Road 
um, all the way up into the project. Uh, construction of booster pumps, which is going to help water pressure in your overall system. The completion of bridge structures over Apache Wash and, and on Saddle Mountain 36th Street. Complete the roadway improvements on Saddle Mountain 32nd Street and Rockaway Wells. Do all the landscaping and revegetation along those routes. Install underground electric lines from 26th Street and Joy Ranch Road all the way up to our project. And acquire additional right of way along Saddle Mountain, which we've already done and have sent the deed of gift over to the town to accept. Next slide, please. Um, all our engineering plans are done. We've been working with town staff on this for almost a year now, redoing the plans. Um, your town engineer, Mr. Prinzhorn, has those plans. I believe that one of his comments was they were some of the best plans he's seen submitted. Um, so we are ready to go with this. Um, the plans are at the town and we can begin construction as soon as we get the financing. The schedule for this project is as follows. Uh, we started this conversation uh, back in January and we are submitting the petition or well, submitted the petition this, this past week. Um, there's a process here and the process is that we must have your consent to form the district. There's a petition which we're asking your approval on today and then there's a series of hearings after this. So whatever is done today is not to be fate of complete. It is merely the start of a process that allows exploration. And that's what we're asking for, is the ability to start this process, explore the issues associated with various forms so that you can make an informed decision after all that exploration is, is complete. Next slide, please. Um, does the town have any expense in this? No. We will pay for all the expenses that the town has pay your attorney's fees and all of the reasonable fees. Um, we're paying for the costs associated with creating the district, and after that, the district pays its own ongoing expenses. All the improvements that are installed are installed to your plans and specifications, inspected by your town engineer, and then they are gifted to you like all other improvements are normally done. Next, please. Um, the question has been asked of us how quickly we can finish this and get the existing water line, which has no water in it right now, activated so that the residents along 26th Street can have access to it. The answer to that question is quickly. We need to pressure test it, chlorinate it, fix any damage that may have occurred while it's been sitting in the ground for the last eight years. And then we're also proposing to fix what's known as an impingement south of what was constructed originally. It's a problem in the line of the existing system the town owns, which prevents water pressure on our side of the line from being able to be um, sufficient uh, during certain times of the year. So we'll go in and fix that as well. Next slide, please. Um, the cost of doing that work is about $100,000. Uh, flush chlorinate repairs about 50. Fees and permits for the town and the uh, county for this is about 60. Fixing the impingements is about $40,000. Next slide, please. Um, we have an open work order with Markham Contracting to do this work. So Markham's ready to go as soon as we tell them to. They've looked at it, they know the plans and specs, they're ready to do the work. Next slide, please. When will the existing water line be activated? Really, that answer depends on both the town and on Maricopa County. Um, from the time that we're given approval to start, it's about four to six months. And that really does depend on how long it takes the county to give us approval to be able to do it. Maricopa County um, Department of Environmental Services and the Health Department. Next slide. Um, there's several alternatives for creating this district. We've had discussions with staff and the council over the past three months almost. It's actually this discussion started before the holidays. Um, the discussions have been around two particular forms, what are known as a uh, revitalization district or community facilities district. Community facilities district is better known the RD is, is effectively and essentially exactly the same, one difference being the formation of the board. Besides that, they function the same. We're asking for the formation of an R, a revitalization district. Next slide. Um, so does the town have the authority to do this? The answer is yes. Under uh, Arizona Revised Statutes, you do. Um, I do one of these. Uh, the revitalization district is a much newer form. It was actually uh, essentially established during the recession. So there's been very little development and need for it up until this time. 
Um, the infrastructure is financed by the district, includes all the water systems, sewer systems, drainage, flood control systems, roadway facilities, landscaping, and other things of that nature. Um, that is the same for both, both forms of, of district. Next slide, please. So, statute allows landowners to petition municipalities for the establishment of a district encompassing their land holdings only. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're simply asking you to allow us to encumber ourselves um, through the formation of the district and sale of bonds, which would provide us a long term financing. Next slide. Um, are you liable for anything? The answer is no. The land, which is owned by Canada Springs, uh, is the only collateral in this equation. And the town provides no obligation, it provides no guarantee. It's not reflected on your financial statements. It's not even included in the application that we have to fill out or that Piper Jaffrey has to fill out to underwrite this. The town's not involved in this liabilities at all. Um, it's not even um, something that is, is typically included as a contingent liability um, to the town in, in any form whatsoever. But we can talk more about that in detail with Piper Jaffrey and Mr. Hicks. Next slide, please. So what happens if the project fails? Uh, previous council had asked questions about is there a market demand for this project? We've just completed our um, market analysis by Duff Fiore Consulting. And um, that was to do two things. One was to find uh, price ranges and to make sure that they're in line with what our performa is. And two, look at absorption rates. And Duff Fiore has confirmed for us that there is a demand for what we are proposing to sell at sufficient rates for us to warrant pursuing this development. Um, next slide, please. Is the town better or worse off? So this really is an analysis of the uh, net gain or loss of the town. And there is a zero, zero sum gain or loss in terms of cost, income, or liability. From the town's perspective, you um, require developers to install infrastructure when it is uh, accepted by the town, it's turned over to the town, and that is exactly what is going to happen in this case. The district is merely a financing mechanism. Um, the town approved the plans uh, for this project years ago. The plots are recorded. Um, our development plans are finished. We're ready to start construction. Um, once we do that, this process looks exactly like it does for any other development. The only difference is how we choose to finance it. And we're asking for the right to be able to go seek this long-term financing. Next slide. Um, so what approvals do we have in place right now with the town? Fully executed development agreement, vested development rights, fully executed line extension agreement for the water line, recorded plots, which have just been approved um, to provide the additions to them. Next, next slide. The other question was asked by the previous council was the impact on the landowners themselves. Uh, the impact is about uh, $2,418 per year for a minimum lot, which is one and a half acres. And this is a, um, an amount which is paid through your property tax bill. Next slide, please. Um, these are the estimated costs of the district. Um, Cost to expand the district, additional uh, estimated costs and total costs. There's about 19, almost $20 million worth of uh, improvement costs that we still need to make. And that is the water line, storage tank, the bridge structures, all the landscaping, <coughs> making all of that facility available for the town's uh, use and the residents' use as well is the future residents of Colorado Springs. Next slide. So, next steps. We're here to ask your approval or authorization to form the district. We actually brought two petitions um, with us this evening. Uh, one is a petition for the uh, community facilities district, and one is a petition for the revitalization district. We can move both along simultaneously, and after the exploration period, choose which one you want, reject the other one, and move forward with one of them. Um, there are two additional hearings which we must hold regardless of the form of the district. So we need to come back to you, we need to continue to work with your council, and we must flush out all of these details. And then we would like to form the district and move forward as quickly as we can. Uh, I've got both Mr. Hicks 
and uh, Mr. Schwartz and Ms. Demick here also to answer any questions or address any of your concerns. Okay, Council, questions? I have a couple Council. questions for clarity. Um, um, what's the difference between the two different districts? That so, you're talking about uh, revitalization versus. Uh, community facilities. Let me ask Mr. Hicks and Mr. Schwartz to answer okay, this question first. Let me ask you the other question that you can answer. Um, do you already have lines in already from 2009? Had you begun the project back then or 2008? Councilman Clancy, said yes. We started construction of the offsite improvements. We connected to a fire hydrant at Joy Ranch Road and 26th Street. If you drive north on 26th Street from Joy Ranch Road, you notice fire hydrants along the roadway. Uh, that line extends to Saddle Mountain Road and then extends east about two thirds of the way to 32nd Street, which is where the work was stopped. In addition to that water line, we also installed a conduit for underground power, telephone, cable TV, and fiber optic lines. Does it, it stop at the property, or have you no. already laid the plats out and it's already going to the property? No, it, it has, the work stopped short of our property. Okay. So there's still additional work in order to get all of those improvements onto our property. Okay, so you got it up to the property and then you want to distribute it out? No, it's not to our property as yet. Okay, so it has to get up to the property and then you and, and what we're asking for is financing, not for the distribution within the project itself. We are only asking for those true public facilities, which get us up to the top of the hill, put in a water storage tank for about 320,000 gallons, the booster pumps, all the lines, and all the drainage systems. Once you get into the subdivision itself, we're not asking to finance that through this mechanism. Um, that, that, there are a lot of thoughts that go along with that, but uh, and the, the one that you also said was um, at a certain point of time, you're going to turn this over, you're going to have a three-member board, and then you're going to turn it over to the folks who live in the community. Correct. When would that take place? Would it be after they're all sold? No. So the minute there's enough residents to form a board, we turn it over to them. So three people. It could be. We're happy to do that. We have no desire to control the board in perpetuity. And the board's responsibility or the public's responsibility within this is to do what? Simply to consent to the formation of the board, uh, excuse me, the district itself. Which entails what? On their half. On your half? I mean on the town's part? Well, or, or the, the residents? You're saying you're going to turn this over to the community. Yes. Lives there. Yes. And they'll form their three or five member board. What is their responsibility? Why would they have to take it on? Well, they take it on because they live there. Okay, and we will not be owning land in there in perpetuity. Right. We'll ultimately sell it out. Their only obligation is normal governance of the board. And quite frankly, there's almost nothing for them to do because the board has no other duty. Okay, other than to make sure that the bonds get paid. Oh, but they're taking on the bonds and the payment of the bonds. The, the way that this works is that the community itself, okay, just like a property tax. So this is growth paying for growth, as I had said. Okay. And, and they'll know that prior to their purchase of their property. They, they absolutely have to be because we have full disclosure of this subdivision report that has to be approved. And you're saying this is financed over 30 years, is that what you're at? That is correct. Mr. Hicks? Just if I may, my name is William Hicks. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Valley Spar uh, in Phoenix and 14 other cities all over the country. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I hope I can answer some of your questions. With respect to your question about how the bonds get paid, the, the bonds are paid by virtue of assessment on each lot. And each person who buys a home in a lot pays an annual assessment. Those monies are used to pay the bonds. When the district is turned over to the homeowners, or people who own the lots that are being assessed, they will then have the ability, if for example, the market should improve, to, to create a refunding bond that would reduce everybody's assessments. Just like you refinance your mortgage when the rates go down, 
these people would have the right to issue new bonds with a lower interest rate, pay off the old bonds, and reassess everyone at a lower level. So that's one thing the board would be doing along the way. Plus, if there are any additional improvements in the district that needed to be made on a public basis, they would be able to finance those through the same mechanism by increasing the assessment on each lot a minimal amount to pay for whatever incremental improvements they wanted to put into the district. So what kind of permanence are you talking about? Is this all underground utilities as well as with water, if there's a faulty line, that well, type of thing? Yes and no. I mean, if, if they needed to do a significant uh, replacement of the lines, that might be a capital investment and they might be able to finance it. might choose to finance that with additional assessments. If it was repair, that's something the district would do on a continuing basis. So the town would also be involved in repairs and, and maintenance of, of the facilities. Just because it's dedicated to the town, it's public infrastructure at that point. And, and if I may back up to your question on the difference between the two districts. The community facilities district was was uh, created in the mid, to, to the mid early 2000, 2004, 5, 6, and has been used extensively to do these kinds of projects. The revitalization district is a newer uh, entity, newer design, if you will, but it has exactly the same scope of powers. It can finance exactly the same improvements. The significant difference is the governance. The governance of a community facilities district rests with the town council. And therefore, some people have perceived or feared or been concerned that that somehow allows a line to be drawn from the town to the district that might create liability. So the revitalization district is really a device by which a public district is formed that can finance all of the same infrastructure, but the, but the operation and oversight is turned over to the public. So the town has no involvement and therefore no one can draw a line between the town and the district and try to trace liability back to the town. That's the, realistically the only difference between a community facilities district and a revitalization district. I hope that's helpful and not too confusing. Sir, what it means for me, just <clears throat> based on my background and experience, it appears to be a very large improvement district with two different parts. Is that a true characterization? Uh, Councilman Esther, I'm not sure I follow your question. You say there's two large. Well, you have two different districts, and I'm thinking it's an improvement district, which will be paid for by the owner. Yeah, no, Councilman Esther. There is one district, and there is a choice as to the form of that district. And our preference is for a revitalization district or an RD, as opposed to the CFD. We also believe that there is less chance of contingent liability being being on the, uh, the um, being laid at the feet of the town with an RD. But we're looking at forming one district. And if I may amplify that slightly, when we talk about district liability, or I mean, town liability, I should hasten to point out that in the, both the case of the CFD and the re revitalization district, both types of districts, whichever one is formed, there is no statutory or other liability on the part of the town. But there are people who draw lines, I guess you call them lawyers, and they, they, they try to make that leap between the control of the district on the part of the town in the case of the CFD. And they therefore say, well, then, then the town has some liability for whatever the district does. It's not true legally. The, the district is a separate legal entity. And every offering document that offers special assessment bonds or revenue bonds or even GO bonds, uh, CFDs can offer GO bonds, uh, which we have no intention of doing. Uh, every one of the offering documents for those things expressly in big bold letters disclaims any liability on the part of the sponsor of town or city. Uh, and, and I don't know of anyone who's actually been held liable, although people make that have that question in their mind. It raises some concern. As a follow-up question, it's helped me a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to frame it. Because it's somewhat new and different, are there any existing models in the state of Arizona that are used in this process? Um, Councilman Esser, are you talking about CFDs or, or RDs or either one? Either one? The, the CFD is used frequently. There's many, many examples of that in many towns across the state. In fact, it's a 
common form of public finance across the United States. Um, the RD is a newer, as Mr. Hicks likes to say, a, a new and improved version of the CFD. If you read the two statutes, they look almost exactly the same, except for the, the governance piece. So that's the, that is the issue in question, is how new is the RD versus the CFD, which has been frequently used. Okay. For now, I guess I'm, I'm trying to digest that, but that's okay. Thank you. Additional questions from council? Vice Mayor <clears throat> Actually, I have a question for Cal, our council. Is that for you, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Council, I, I thank you for your memorandum that you gave us earlier. Have the issues uh, and concerns that you raised been addressed? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, remind members of the council, um, this is not our firm Jerry, that's the team. However, we did forward the documents that were provided to council to the town uh, bond council. Fred Rosenfeld is the firm of Gus Rosenfeld. He had not seen them before. He did do an initial review. He was very sorry he was not able to be here tonight. He did have some questions, some issues with the documents. He uh, asked for the opportunity to address the council on those issues uh, before a decision uh, is made tonight, including he had, I think he had some advice regarding the two kinds of districts. He also noted what he thought was an error in the legal description. So again, he, he was sorry to be here tonight. My understanding is that council wishes he can be here on April 20th, and he would be the person, I would be the if I tried to advise you on these issues, but he would be the person who should advise you. Councilman Lamar, yep. um, Mr. Hicks did speak with your bond council today about, I think there were four issues, um, and he was able to discuss them. Three of them were really just minor nitpicky cleanup things, and we modified the petition to address those and submitted them back to the town. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, if I may, I spoke with uh, Mr. Roosevelt, and he identified four concerns in, in the uh, presentation, the proposal, the proposition. One was, he's correct, there was a, an error in the legal description, which we've corrected. There was a typographical, one number was, was inverted, and so we've corrected that. It was a minor, nothing for us What's that? He nothing is, for us to He is indeed. Uh, the second thing is he questioned the, the use of the word utility district, and we're not married to the word use of the word utility in the district. There are utility districts in the state. There are other utility <coughs> districts in other states. They're all different. Uh, we propose suggesting the use of the word special district, which gets rid of all of the, the different nuances and different um, um, verbiage that can be used. That's simple. He did raise a question, which I'm, uh, of which I'm familiar. There's a, uh, a, a number of special districts that were financed in Florida by a developer who retains significant control over the districts uh, to the extent that he, 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 it, she, I'm not sure who it was, but the developer retained the ability to, to uh, sell golf course memberships and health club memberships in the projects that they were developing. And the IRS has taken the position that that's not public infrastructure, that somebody is benefiting from a public development, and that's inappropriate. They also raised the question about community governance. The villages is, I think it's well over 100,000 people at this point. I should know my sister actually lives there. Uh, it's fully developed, and yet the developer is still in control. As, as you heard Mr. Staff say earlier, that's not our goal here. Our goal here is to get the houses built, homeowners to take over the district the first opportunity they can. That's we have no interest in, we have no interest, no incentive, no desire to uh, to run the district for any longer than it's absolutely necessary to get houses sold. And last, he talked about uh, there was not an express provision in the in the petition to the town that uh, con committee to pay the towns. Uh, necessary and, and reasonable costs and expenses in connection with the district. That's in the petition now. It was an oversight. It was always intended that the development would pay your costs and expenses and the council's costs and expenses. So those are the four items that Mr. Roosevelt raised. Uh, I'm happy to give more detail on, on any of them if you wish. Well, I guess during your conversation, did he express to you that he was satisfied with the resolution? He didn't express any objection. I didn't ask specifically about his satisfaction with the resolution. He seemed to be satisfied with it. As I say, these were, he said he had these four concerns, and I made a list of them as he, as he told me about them. 
It's too bad he couldn't have been here telephonically. I don't have any other questions. Any questions from council? Uh, if we give approval today, if there are two additional meetings you mentioned, the, the nature of those meetings will be what? Um, they, they are similar to these. They are exploratory and they are for public comment. They are for your information. Um, what we're asking is that we get the process started. We've been dealing with this and the town has been dealing with this project for a long time. We're not asking you to agree to one particular thing tonight but to allow us to move this project along. Because it's every time we delay, we delay another two weeks and another two weeks. And um, you know, we are anxious to one, get the water line finished so that residents have access to it. We're anxious to get this project moving. Uh, finance markets are fickle things. Uh, we believe that the finance market today for these is extremely good. I think uh, Mr. Schwartz would tell you that it's a uh, very good time to be selling these bonds. Delay sometimes um, has a tendency to kill deals. Um, we're not asking you to commit to something that is irreversible today, but to allow the process to continue. So, I do have a question. <coughs> so, if in fact there's other issues that um, our bond attorney has, and in his mind they're not resolved, you see the dilemma I mean, is that we have. Uh, we have a we have a secondhand request from council that we just you know, take a little time so we can discuss this with our attorney. And I'm not doubting for a second your, your take on the conversation, but uh, is there a way that we can <laughs> resolve this so that we don't have delay, but we have some assurance that our attorney doesn't scream and go, "Hey, wait, I need to talk to you," and you've made a big mistake. Good question, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yes, uh, as Mr. Staff pointed out. The action tonight merely starts a process. There are several more steps in the process in which this council must concur along the way. At any of those points, you could say, we're done. We don't like what we hear. We don't like where this is headed. We're out of this. And that's it. The project is, is done. If Mr. Rosenfeld has a question that comes up next week, a week later, a week after that, in the course of these pro um, various hearings in this process, we're more than happy to make whatever adjustments, or at least to hear his concerns and, and to address them. Yeah. Mayor, if I said maybe I could, I could add one thing that may or may not help council. Because Mr. Roosevelt indicated us some concerns with the form of the resolution, if council approves it tonight, normally we approve it as the form. We would wait until a new resolution is submitted that you know, Fred tells us is okay. So, and that, that, doesn't say you can or can't approve it, just that there would be an additional step even if you approve before we actually sign okay, up. I just want to make sure that we got Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and if I could add just one more comment. Susan Demmett with Cambridge and Burnham. Um, the action that we're asking you to take tonight is simply to approve the resolution of intent. So it's the very first step in a longer process. And all of the sort of the meat and potatoes of the district, if you will, will be negotiated after this first step. They're not actually included in this resolution itself. And so they'll be memorialized in later resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Council, Well, on the resolution on page two, this is housekeeping. You refer under section two agreement to further findings by the city. We're still a town. And the same thing is true on page three. I thought you could walk this. <laughs> I will take ownership for that despite being resident of the town. The same thing that today. On page three. It's, it's, it's a town, not a city. So they're just a little picky. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so thank you. There is public comment on the agenda. Carrie Smith? Mayor, Council, uh, Terry Smith, Cape Creek resident. I actually uh, have several, what I think are serious omissions from the draft general plan for the Colorado Springs Utility District or Special District, however we're going to refer to it, and they would apply whether it's an RD or a CFD. The first of these uh, relates to the 
requirements for potable water. All of the attention in the document and the planning document is to the infrastructure to provide water to the residences that would be in the Cahaba Springs development. But there is no attention to the amount of water that would be needed for those residents, which a rough estimate puts at about 120 to 130 acre feet of water per year when they're fully built out. The 2013 Cave Creek Water Master Plan estimates that the town does not now have sufficient water when we realize build out. Build out for us occurs before the end of the planning horizon for Cahaba Springs, at least with respect to the term of the bonds, which they're suggesting is 30 years. So our build out estimates in the 2013 Water Master Plan come before the termination of this, and we would be roughly 65 acre feet per year short. Now, the 2013 Water Master Plan included a request for 1,100 acre feet of water from the Central Arizona project, and something major has changed since that water master plan and certainly since 2008 when this development was proposed and that is the shortfall in central arizona project water that is anticipated in 2017. now most of the public reports on that suggest that the immediate effects of that shortfall will fall on agriculture in the state not on residential users however the residential users that will experience it before anyone else are the small towns like Cave Creek. So I think that some attention must be given to the water supplies for this community in addition to the infrastructure. Second, under Arizona Revised Statute Title 48261, uh, as amended in 2011, it allows for the posting of bonds on the part of individuals who seek special taxing districts. It seems to me that this is a special taxing district of one type or another to cover the costs incurred at the county level as a result of that district. Well, it seems to me there are costs that are going to be incurred at the town level should any element in this fail. And I'm particularly concerned about the Cave Creek residents who would be supplied by the water lines and the public infrastructure associated with this. Lastly, this analysis, the, uh, the requirements for a, uh, an application for this type of planning requires for an impact analysis under Arizona Revised Statute 262, which requires that there be documents assessing the impacts on other parties not associated with this landowner that would be immediately affected. And those are the people who would be supplied by water. And there's no impact analysis in this either. Thank you. Yeah, Good evening again. I hope I can share some other thoughts that I haven't heard here tonight. Uh, Councilwoman Pansy, you asked a good question. Special district boards enjoy many of the same governing powers as town or city or county. They can enter into a contract, they employ workers, they can acquire property through purchase or eminent domain. They can issue debt, impose taxes, level assessments, and charge fees for their services. Special districts can sue and be sued. Public policy, like our general plan and our zoning laws, should determine the location, timing, and intensity of any development, not public works. Because special districts are a major provider of public works, such as water and utilities. They can have a significant effect on our local development. We control land use within our town boundaries by adopting our general plan, and we have zoning laws. Did you know, has staff told you, has the applicant told you, and the attorney, the town attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, 
The special districts can ignore, <coughs> they can override our general plan and our zoning laws. Special districts have independent governing bodies which may have different development ideas of what our town should and shouldn't be. The potential for inconsistency without our general plan could exist. The neighborhood surrounding this proposed district could be so negatively impacted by losing the protection of our general plan and our zoning laws. Has the neighborhoods been advertised about this? Are they even aware that this is possibly going to be taking place? Maybe it could be put in their water bill. But I guess the other thing I'm concerned about, and I'd like our town attorney to answer if possible, uh, if they incur such a debt, we're in debt by $50 million. If they incur such a debt and they should go under, um, how, how would that impact those of us who are property owners in the town outside of this district? Are we required to pick up the tab? Thank you for your time. And no other speakers. Harry Smith, 26th Street. We are impacted by this. I have been in front of this council and some members of the previous council, and I think most of you understand we need water, okay? We have been promised and promised water. We have been promised the town was going to take over this line. We have been promised the mayor has said that, well, Cahaba Springs doesn't do it, we'll do it. I've been told by the town engineer we don't have the money to do it so the town isn't going to do it okay what I understand if I break it down as a citizen who's impacted by this somebody's going to put a big mortgage on their land to put in roads water and other utilities which directly affect us where I live in the West Cape Creek area <clears throat> there's going to be no no cost to the town okay they're simply asking tonight let's get this thing started I've been saying this for nine years, okay? Let's go ahead and let them get this thing started. If there's something in here and it's already been emphasized over and over, the town has no liability. I have no liability. The town has already agreed with Cahaba Springs as soon as they complete that section up by my house, the town will take it over and we will have water again, you know, finally in our area, okay? We're having water delivered now at $65 a load, and we've been doing this for years. And so we need water. We have fire hydrants. We have high insurance bills because the town has not taken over the lines. The town has not put up the money to get it connected. The problem lies in a piece of town-owned water line. Nothing to do with Cahaba Springs. Cahaba Springs now says the town doesn't have the money to fix their own line so you can get water. So they're going to fix the line. So I am pleading tonight for all of us over in the area that is being affected to go ahead and let's get this thing rolling. Apparently there's going to be a couple other meetings. You can work out these other differences. They seem very eager to uh, fix whatever may be fixed. But I see no reason for any kind of delay. And let's go on. Let's get to the second meeting, the third meeting, and then maybe I can get some more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Mayor, Council, I think when you moved where you did, that you knew there wasn't water. I had 12 gallons a minute to the well. There was plenty of water. What happened to the well? Well, water tables go down. Oh. I'm sorry. All right. Um, first of all, I wonder where copies of the presentation were for citizens to maybe have a look uh, as to what you're presenting. And number two, you're here to make money. And right not for the good of Cave Creek. So why was the project abandoned years ago? 
He's the same in person, just a different name. Uh, infrastructure was put in and abandoned. I have been up there, I've seen the fire hydrants that say non working or whatever. And I've seen where there were cactus um, put in for uh, vegetation and stuff that were abandoned. Everybody stole the Savaros, there were only barrel cactus left. But why was the project abandoned the first time? Number one, bond performance bonds were not required by, by the council at that time. And I ask again the question, why is this project going totally around the subdivision ordinances we have in place? Why? Because he's a director of real estate de development at ASU, he knows how to go around these kinds of things. And that is not what Cape Creek is about. Third, in the water master plan of years ago, there was supposed to be a water tank built in 2010. There is no water tank. So, and we're looking at 1.5, one and a half acre lots of building block, um, not Western style, if anybody has ever seen, you know, what's been published in Arizona Republic and Images Magazine, they're boxes. Yeah, it's Frank Lloyd White, but that's not, that's not Western rural lifestyle. Thank you. Public comment is still open. Mr. Scott, you have the last word. Is there anything you need to say? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. A um, couple of things I think I would like to have Mr. Schwartz maybe address a couple of the technical issues regarding the district. Um, for those members of the council who were not in the council or the planning and zoning commission when the Hobby Street was first approved, um, we gave the town 700 acre feet of water. We have in a short 100 year water supply. Our plots are approved and recorded. We've not gone around the subdivision ordinance at all. Um, I gave three and, a half mil, uh, three and a half miles of trails to the town. We gifted, okay, 80 acres immediately to the town, provided another 130 acres of open space in the town. We're hardly simply trying to be the pigeons that fly in and crap all over the place. Um, I think we've worked harder than just about anybody else who's tried to develop something in this town. So I think there is a lot of education that still needs to occur with certain people, but um, we've tried to be very good citizens about, about being in the town. But I'd like to have Mr. Schwartz address some of the technical issues for a moment. I am uh, Greg Swartz with the firm Piper Jaffrey. Um, Piper Jaffrey is a financial services firm. We advise communities throughout the state to uh, tell their waters for me to choose on, et cetera, et cetera. We also help uh, communities and districts issue bonds. Um, first of all, if you imagine that uh, my uh, left hand here is development and my right hand is district, many of the issues raised are about development. They're not about the district. So water supply issues, Mark has addressed, they are completely, totally independent of the logic or illogic or benefit or non-benefit of forming a district. Uh, the town still exercises all of the same rights it does now for planning, zoning, the type of infrastructure built. You have not given up, nor will you give up anything by forming a district. A district does not, repeat, does not, have the same authority as a municipality. A district, by definition, is an area within your incorporated boundaries. As an example, you have two school districts that overlap you, okay? They don't have planning and zoning rights independent of this council. You have uh, SRP that is covering this area. They don't have planning and zoning rights independent. 
of what you your authority is. So the bottom line is right now you, you got to separate district from development. There might be some development issues, but it sounds like most of, if not all of them, have been addressed. In terms of the district issues, this district could not trump any authority by the town. Okay, right now you have eleven districts that overlap the the, the town of King Creek. They range again from SRP all the way down to a school district. They include an overlapping fire district. They include several districts. None of those districts have authority that trumps your municipal authority. So forming a district, you do not give up any authority. Um, finally, um, the, um, in terms of issuing debt, it, it, it is essential to understand it's not a question of whether there's going to be debt associated with this development. Okay, it's just a question of how to do that most efficiently. And if you're familiar with the bond markets in the United States, there's a thing called tax exempt bonds. So the holders of those bonds don't pay state or federal income tax. Okay, that's cheaper to anybody that benefits from that infrastructure, as opposed to financing it any other way. So that's really what this district is about. It's not about subordinating your authority. It's not about getting around zoning and planning. It is about putting in infrastructure at the least cost possible while still conforming to your requirements. Thank you. And somebody asked the question earlier, I'll just address it now. There, there are about 75 to 90 districts throughout Arizona of this nature, either revitalization districts or CFDs. Only two of them really are have ongoing operating authority. One of them is associated with the city of Apache Junction. It operates a wastewater utility because the town doesn't have what we call Title IX authority to be in the utility business. So the CFD operates, and there's one other example of that. And while we're on the subject of uh, Apache Junction, the largest bond default in Arizona history uh, um, occurred in Apache Junction with a special district. The impact on the city of Apache Junction was nothing. The bondholders understood that their rights and their remedies began and ended with the district. We know that because we're the financial advisor to the city of Apache Junction, did the work out, the bondholders got paid, it just extended the payment, but it did not impact the city of Apache Junction at all. Thank you. So what you're saying is, with regard to this whole thing, going back to my original question, is that it's the homeowners who are paying this kind of utility tax, but they're actually paying for the bonds because they're tax-free? Essentially, the bonds are the way to accelerate construction. Well, I understand that, but is it, is And then the special assessments are used to pay off those bonds. bonds. And do they have any say so, or have you, I mean, have you done your homework? they really want to pay it off in 30 years? Um, you know, generally speaking, this is really a matter of trying to make it as affordable as possible up front. But given the nature of this kind of bond, not unlike your, Cape Creek has been in the business of improvement districts before. So this is not the first one. Um, and, and the nature of land sales are a special assessment Literally, those bonds get for that particular if the property transfers ownership from homeowner A to homeowner B. Usually, the bank steps in and says, pay off those special assessments. So, the probability that these bonds will be outstanding for the full term, it just depends on whether homeowner A stays there for 30 years. Councilman Clancy, um, two things. One is, until there's homeowners there, we are paying those bond payments. Okay? So, we're accepting this burden. If, if for some reason the project doesn't move ahead, we continue to make those payments. We don't make those payments. Same thing happens if it's a bank. The bondholders foreclose, they take the property. It's zero to do with the town. The other is every single homeowner in that district has the option to pay off that underlying bond for their portion. 
Okay? So if half the project gets built, it stops. Nothing bad happens to those half that are living there. They just continue to make their payments, okay? If one of those owners decides he wants to pay that off and nobody else does, they can pay it off. They don't have to pay their annual assessment anymore. So you're you're saying, Mr. Andrews, if I get clarity, you're saying if that person <coughs> says I will pay my thirty years worth of assessment in one lump sum, they're they're fine. They pay it off. It's not their assessment one lump sum, you're just not paying interest. <coughs> just like paying off your mortgage early. No, I understand. You're paying the principal payment. If they want to, they can. So having sat on a school board for sixteen years, when we usually would assess the bond market before we sold our bonds. I mean it wasn't an automatic fifteen or twenty yes. years. It, it was where was the market? It's it's a different phase, obviously. Yes. And, and we have assessed that market, which is why we have Piper Jaffrey here. They've already gone out and looked at the market and said, "Listen, we think that there's a good market right now for these. We think this is a good time to sell them, and there's a lot of demand for these kinds of bonds from Arizona. So we wouldn't be up here doing this if we didn't think it was a feasible approach." Sure. Let me just ask one one question here before I do this. We changed it from utility to special, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And all we're doing is giving you the go ahead to get moving. It's going to come back before us where we actually approve you doing it, is it? That is correct. All right, we're, I'm good to go then. Move to approve resolution R2015-12, a resolution of the Mayor and Town Council of the Town of Cave Creek, Arizona, declaring intent to form the Cahaba Springs Special District. Second. <coughs> Motion has been made and second. Thank you, Councilman Bunch. You know, I've been watching you for long, and shame on you for letting the global economy go in the tank while you were trying to develop this. I mean, I'm really ashamed of you for that. Actually, I'm happy to see you moving forward, and I hope everything works out for you. Let's let's get going, and let's get get let's get Terry some water pressure. Hey, <laughs> Councilman Bunch, I go to bed every night with the guilt of the global financial. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure those are your thoughts. Look, we need to get this rolling. I, I appreciate your persistence. That's right. I, we are nothing if not persistent in desirous of doing what we set out to do 10 years ago or more. No liability to the town. Benefit to the west side. Where is the downside? This is great. Councilman Walensky, excuse me. Uh, I have uh, nothing to say. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's sleepy. Councilman Walensky, anything? I appreciate the offer. Yeah, you bet. The only thing I have noticed is since I mentioned it, 10 plus years ago, is your hair spray. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, Councilman Walensky. I don't hide behind things. Wait. Dumbing my hair. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess um, my question is, is Terry, having heard you get up and talk about wanting to have a street that comes from 26 directly into town without having to do Carefree Highway, uh, it might impact you more than you realize because that's a lot of more folks who might feel the same way. With that in mind, again, I let's move forward and see what happens. Thank you. <coughs> Carry the vote, please. Councilman Esser? Yes. Councilman Bunch? Yes. Councilman McClancy? Yes. Vice Mayor Yes. Councilman McGuire? Yes. Councilman Lipsky? Yes. Mayor Brian Sears? Uh, yes, Brian Sears. Vote is seven zero zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Mayor Council. Good luck. The promise to work closely with your staff and yourself. Let's go on to agenda item number six, and then we'll come to the city council. The city council discussion and approval of resolution 2015-11 be adopted 
No, back in the back of the Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, next case on your agenda, SPR 1401, McDonald's Phase 2, for a site plan review. The project is located at 53rd Street and Carefree Highway. Uh, subject to the site area is approximately half an acre, 25,283 square feet. Uh, the applicant is proposing a commercial building totaling approximately 2,856 square feet. That includes uh, the canopy, outdoor dining area. Uh, the project also contains a drive-through window, uh, which is allowed within the general commercial zones. Uh, council members of the public may remember that a Referendum uh, petition was filed after the uh, town council rezoned the property December 3rd, 2012. The uh, ballot measure was the public vote took place on May 21st, and the resulting uh, decision was that the town council uh, was affirmed by the voters. Uh, as I stated, the project does have a drive through window, which is allowed within general commercial zones. All of the off-street parking uh, requirements are met. The, the lighting on site is within compliance of the ordinance. Uh, the applicant has not yet provided any signage details, but it will be part of the building permit review at such time the applicant submits plans. There is a, you'll notice on the site plan, an area between where the McDonald's was approved and this area. That will come back through Commission and Council uh, as a phase three to this project uh, overall. Um, with that, I will answer any questions Council may have. Thank you. Questions from Council? Anything else? Uh, I'm sorry, Council and Dr. Make it clear it meets every criteria we have laid out in the, in the ordinances in the, in the building. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ma Mayor, members of Council, it, meets and exceeds in most cases uh, exceeding the minimum required building setbacks exceeds the landscape undisturbed area requirements of the town. Um, so yes, thank you. Okay, uh, presenting for the applicant. Is this gentleman presenting for the applicant? Uh, Mayor Sewer Jean. Oh, I, I know Mr. Jean, but I'm just... Mr. Jean, are you presenting for the applicant? Yes, sir. It's been a long evening for you folks already, and uh, it's nice to see some of the new faces and returning faces, <laughs> and older faces, like mine and everybody else. Uh, I'm Stuart Jean, I'm a, one of the principals of Park West Development. Uh, this project has been around for a long time. And uh, what we're here to, this evening to do is to talk about being a food service building on the west end of the property. You all know we came through here about a year ago with McDonald's. And one of the things I'd like to just say real quickly this evening is uh, McDonald's. Uh, you all may be aware of some of their um, opportunities, I guess we might say, that they're having nationwide. And uh, we have had rigorous discussions and many discussions with McDonald's about them moving forward. And Canada has caused some concern for us, um, myself as an investor and owner of the project. <clears throat> but I'm here tonight to tell you that I can't give you an exact date as to when they're going to start the building. But there's every indication that they will build the building in the near future. Uh, they have executed their lease with me. They're paying all of their rent. They have paid all their impact fees. They have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for improvements, uh, building permits, everything. And in fact, <laughs> until about 30 or 45 days ago, we were under the impression that they were going to start uh, in April. Uh, they have recently had a nationwide 
and a turn of war type of deal, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been quite uh, prominent in the newspapers and things. McDonald's is a heck of a company. We've gone back to them and asked them if they would like to step aside. We've had other people who are interested in their site, and they're not interested. And much to my dismay, I wish they would be building because it's slowed us down. And so what we're here tonight to have you approve is an additional quick service restaurant on the west side of the property. Once we can get one of these guys under construction, then we're going to come back and fill in with normal retail type of businesses in between the two buildings. That's what we've always planned. And when we've had this delay, we jumped over in an effort to get the ball rolling, shall we say, we're going to do this on the West End. Probably the difference between this and the McDonald's situation is um, we're going to own the building, and it's in real estate jargon, a build a suit. So when the lease is executed, I'm in control of building it. And I have to say that in 37, 38 years, I can't count the number of McDonald's that I've done all over the state of Arizona and the Southwest. And we've never not had them on our heels. We couldn't get off of the site fast enough. So with that being said, I know there's been some concern in the community. Don's asked me a dozen times, Linda and everybody else, as to what's going on. Uh, they have 35,000 restaurants. They're not going anywhere. Uh, and they will be in this community sooner than later. So what you have here before you tonight is, is exactly what Luke discussed. I'll be very brief. Uh, it's a quick service restaurant. They uh, sell food products and a lot of coffee. Uh, as the way I, we operate with these people, they don't like to necessarily have their, their desires known to everyone in the community, but that's, that will give you a general idea of what, what we have, uh, have, are doing there. Uh, the top elevation is basically the building. It's very much of a southwest character uh, in nature. Uh, in fact, the building, if I had to pick out a building that's very similar to the design and structure of the building would be the building that the Qantas re recently occupied where the, the uh, kind of the kitchen store had been there. It's very similar in nature to that <coughs> building. In fact, Russell Marcellus, the architect, gentleman standing there by the door, who wants to go home about as bad as I do, and I'll be off too, uh, is the man who's going to be drawing the plans. He's here to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and I'm here likewise. Uh, it's a very simple project. Uh, I think we've made everything, uh, uh, people have very effective uh, planning department here. They, they can keep guys like me in shape pretty well. And I think we're ready to go. And hopefully this meets the, uh, the, the desires of the council tonight. Any questions, please? Questions from the council? <coughs> Okay, we'll public comment on agenda item number five. Oh, that's speaking there. Okay. Would you wish to speak? Okay. I love it. Hi, anyone speaking. My name is Cheryl <coughs> Carmichael Robertson. I have two names. Um, I understand this lack of clarity. Mr. Jamie has worked with this property for quite a while, as I remember, I've been here for 12 years, and originally, as I understood it, it was going to be a McDonald's. <coughs> That's, it's been a couple years, I believe, and then I never really understood that there was a phase two or there was a phase three, and I don't know if any of you have ever driven through that area, and the ingress, egress is a nightmare. Um, I happen to live on El Cigarro, which with Lowe's building has impacted my street tremendously. I know Ian doesn't believe me when I say that, but I, I you know, I live there. So um, I seriously am concerned about having two, uh, I, I'm unhappy about it. Not a little bit. That's neither here nor there. We're going to leave with that. I'm seriously concerned about having two drive through um, restaurants of any kind. And I think that this council really needs to look at the overall picture of that area. Um, 
who had many accidents on the corner of Turkey Highway and Cape Creek Road and and up. I think that it's a serious traffic issue and um, congestion and families and uh, I just think it's a hit and miss thing. I haven't seen the pictures or anything like that. I just this is my um, that's, um, I just thank you for listening to me. I didn't address you properly there as a mayor. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> sure. Move to approve site plan for McDonald's Phase 2, case number SPR 14 01 for commercial building in the general commercial GC zone on an approximately half acre parcel located at the northeast corner of 53rd Street and Carefree Highway. Okay. Uh, I've been been here a long time, and I, I, I certainly hope that we approve this tonight. And Mr. Gene gets a chance to actually build something down there that will bring in some sales tax revenue in the long run. Council, I really have nothing to add except see if you can get them to build it a little quicker. Believe me, I want it to <laughs> badly. Anything else from council? Council, mm -hmm. and Mr. Gene, you made some very uh, some beautiful properties. I hope you bring a beautiful property to Kate Creek. I'm sure you think so. Where are you going? <laughs> Just nice to see you again. Bring your glasses. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please. Okay, all, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The eyes clearly have it. Thank you, Council. Let the record reflect that. Mm -hmm. Council's going to take a five minute recess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> going